An unprecedented move by state lawmakers leads the Texas Supreme Court to delay an execution. He was shocked. He um, thanked his supporters. He praised God. He um, claimed his innocence. We look closer at the legal back and forth with a man's life on the line and why it could bring a death row inmate to testify at the Capitol. Fireworks in the first and only face-off between Ted Cruz and Colin Allred. The moves they're making to reach the undecided right before the start of early voting. Governor Abbott said the state removed thousands of non-citizens from voter rolls, but the numbers tell a different story. An investigation looks closer at who got caught up in the purge. Produced from the Capitol in Austin and airing statewide, this is the award-winning State of Texas. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Ryan Chandler. Josh Hinkle is on assignment. Well, it's the day before the start of early voting in Texas, and normally we'd start the program talking about the battles on the ballot, and we'll get to that. But first, a dramatic, historic legal saga at the Capitol and in the courts, one that is still developing with a man's life on the line. Robert Robertson was set to die on Thursday. He was convicted in 2003 of murdering his two-year-old daughter. But the Texas Supreme Court has halted his execution. It came after a flurry of novel legal maneuvers, a Texas House committee forcing the court's hand and extending Robertson's life. A bipartisan majority of lawmakers joining with medical experts to say Robertson is likely innocent. They're looking into questions surrounding Robertson's conviction and their search for answers may bring a death row inmate to testify at the Capitol for the first time ever. A Hail Mary miracle. He was shocked to say the least. Um, he praised God and he thanked his supporters. A last hour Supreme Court ruling reviving Robert Robertson's chance at life. It is very clear that he needs um, a new trial. A team of lawmakers by his side as the clock ran out on what would have been his last day. Adamant in his innocence and demanding a new trial with new medical evidence. While he is still breathing, there's still time to bring the truth to light. After over 20 years in solitary confinement, Robertson will have the biggest stage in Texas, testifying in person at the Capitol on Monday. It was made clear to us that there was no precedent for what we were doing. I want him to be able to tell his story, what his life was like prior to this, what the investigation look like from his, through his, the lens of you know, his lens. Lawmakers are investigating whether courts are properly following Texas's 2013 junk science law, which allows for new trials in cases where scientific evidence is later found faulty. Experts say the medical records for Robertson's two-year-old daughter, Nikki, indicate she could have died of natural causes, not homicide. When we have government exercise the greatest power that it has, the power to take a life, there must be absolutely unassailable proof and no doubt that a grave and heinous crime occurred, and that's simply not the case. Several Texas lawmakers met with Robertson in the days before his scheduled execution, and some were outside the prison on Thursday night when Robertson learned of his stay. One of those lawmakers is Austin State Representative John Busey. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's not lost on me the gravity of the fact that Robertson woke up on Friday morning. And, and that is only because of some novel creative efforts by the legislature and of course the work of the team that has been working on his behalf for, for years. Uh, just take me through what it was like at the prison when we learned of this news of this day. You know, Representative Hull and I were there. We wanted to be there having met with him and gotten to spend time a few weeks ago knowing him. We wanted him to know that we were there and that there was a team fighting for him on his behalf no matter the outcome yesterday. Our intent was to be present for the execution if it had happened and make sure we were telling his story. Uh, throughout the evening being there, it was you know, a roller coaster of emotions. We had hope, we knew so many people were fighting for him. We believe this is an innocent man and, and that this execution shouldn't happen. There were times throughout the night as it went back and forth that we were getting very concerned that the execution would move forward and that we would have to go be a witness to that and then go talk about it and what it meant for the state of Texas. It's so interesting to watch how this effort has coalesced because it's, it's brought together a very interesting group of lawmakers, some of the yeah. most conservative members of the House and more progressives like yourself. Um, what do you think the bipartisan nature of this says about um, the, the effort? Look, I, I think it shows that when the Texas House is, on, is coordinated and working together, we can get things done. Those, a majority of us, over 80 of us, signed a letter 
asking for this to stop and to slow this down and look at this case more closely. When you look at the spectrum of who's behind it, there's a lot of us that have hardly worked together on issues before, but having looked at this case closely, we knew we could work together and we should work together on this cause because it's so worthy of fighting for justice in this case. A bipartisan majority of the House has signed on uh, believing that he is possibly innocent, working uh, to delay his execution. But there are some voices of this conversation that I think it's interesting are, are so far absent. Yeah. One is the Senate. We haven't heard anything from even the most progressive senators as of uh, last check. And the governor. He, he's the one person who can uh, issue a 30-day reprieve or clemency. Uh, why do you think we haven't heard from them yet? You know, I don't know why we haven't heard from the governor yet. I will say, though, because of the ongoing uh, deliberations. He wasn't forced to have to make a final decision. I'm thankful that he still has the 30-day 30, 30 pause if it's needed in a future time in this case. Um, but I, I hope with the time that Robertson now still has, that he and his staff will continue to look more thoroughly at this case. I think if he looks at it the way the 80-plus of us in the legislature have, he will agree that we, we either need to stop this entirely or at least look at another trial and look at the evidence more closely. What is the best case scenario in your mind for Robertson? Well, I think the key investigator said it, having looked at it myself, that you know we should apologize to this man and send him home. I think that's the best case scenario. But I, but I also think another day in court to get to look at the science and truly look at it, not to, not to push it away or act like it's hearsay, but actually look at the evidence. I think everyone that does that will change their mind about this case. Representative John Busey, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And this is Robertson's second execution date. In 2016, the Court of Criminal Appeals halted his execution just one week before he was scheduled to go to the death chamber. The appeals court sent the case back to the trial court in Anderson County. And Wednesday, the prosecutor in that hearing testified via Zoom before the House Criminal Jurisprudence Committee. Anderson County District Attorney Allison Mitchell said Robertson's attorneys had the chance to present their new evidence to a judge at a hearing in 2021. Mitchell said the judge rejected Robertson's claims. Governor Abbott said the state removed thousands of non-citizens from voter rolls, but an investigative report shows some citizens were caught in that purge. We sit down with one of the reporters behind that story. The first and only face-off between the two men who want to represent you in the U.S. Senate. Why did you not support that, Senator? It's a great question. Can I take his time and no, answer? No, no, you can't so, have my time. But, but what I'm saying, question, no, but I'm you, you, you time, can jump Senator in after me. How the debate is helping candidates reach the undecided right before the start of early voting. Ahead of this year's election, Texas Governor Greg Abbott boasted about the state purging thousands of non-citizens from the voter rolls. But an investigative report from ProPublica, the Texas Tribune, and VoteBeat found some American citizens got swept into that purge. James Bargon from the Texas Tribune is here to break down this reporting. Thank you so much for being with us, James. Thanks. It's good to be with you. So your reporting found that uh, of the approximately 6,500 non-citizens that the governor reported, um, there were some American citizens, and that number of non-citizens was, was pretty inflated. Can you take us through how you arrived at uh, the number you did? Well, the first thing to say about this is that these numbers are very complicated, which is mm -hmm. why experts warn against using them as definitive numbers. So when we saw the governor saying 6,500 non-citizens have been removed from the voter rolls, we immediately had our antenna up. What we did was go to counties, which are the ones that actually remove the voters from the voter rolls, and asked for records requests for the people who had been removed. Among those people, we contacted 70, and at least 10 of those we have talked to and verified are uh, U.S. citizens, and there are more that we haven't talked to who we have been able to verify their birth certificates. So there's definitely been a mix-up here where U.S. citizens are being counted as part of these non-citizens. And as part of this investigation, you spoke uh, to voters who are citizens who maybe didn't even know that they were off the voter rolls. What were they telling you when uh, they found out that they were swept up in this? Well, yeah, they were incredibly surprised. Some of them had no idea that they had been taken off the voter rolls. Uh, the most surprising thing for them was receiving a phone call from a reporter, and that being the first time they were being notified that they were taken off the rolls. Uh, you can imagine their surprise. Do we have any indication of how many American citizens are dealing with that right now? How many were affected by this? We don't know. I mean, the big thing is that our investigation found that only 581 of those are confirmed non-citizens, according to the state. So there are potentially mm. thousands of people who are just simply did not respond to these notifications from the counties and could be in this very situation. 500-something to 6,500 is a That's lot a big jump. different, right. 
Um, well, have you spoken to the governor's office about this or the secretary of state? I'm, I'm sure that they were concerned to learn this. Yes, in our due diligence, we've reached out to every state official involved in this, the attorney general's office, the governor's office, and the secretary of state. The only one that has really responded to us is the secretary of state, and they have cooperated with our investigation to try to give us the information we need to do this, mm. and we continue to work with them as we continue to work on follow-up stories. Governor's quick to advertise when he's found uh, purported non-citizens, but when you may find a mistake, he hasn't responded to that. It's a little bit troubling, yeah, because the claim is is big. And what our story was saying is that it creates this um, situation of distrust in our elections, which is a terrible thing to have two weeks out from an election. Yeah. Um, and so I think it is incumbent on the governor's office to come out and potentially clarify some of this information, which we have uh, proven and the Secretary of State has confirmed uh, is incorrect. Yeah. It's really good work that y'all are doing. Thank you for it. And thank you for joining us to walk us through it. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. A high stakes debate as Ted Cruz and Colin Allred face off in Dallas. Polls show a shift in the race. We take a closer look at the numbers as election day approaches. A big change in the legal battle over how the state cares for children in foster care. Why there may be a new judge and that could change the course of the case. The candidates in the race for Senate squared off Tuesday night in a contentious debate. Colin Allred and Ted Cruz met face to face for the first time at WFAA in Dallas. The debate came at a critical time, just days before the start of early voting. Both candidates looking to shore up support. New polling from the Texas Politics Project at the University of Texas shows Cruz now holds a seven point lead over Allred. That's just outside the poll's margin of error. Libertarian Ted Brown polled at 4%. The historic stakes of this election had both candidates going on offense, hoping to win over voters. Can I take his time and no, answer? No, no, you can't have my time. But, but what I'm saying, no, but but you, want, you, you can jump in after me. Fireworks in the fight for Senate Tuesday night. You know, this is somebody who goes to the Ritz-Carlton in Cancun. Do you really think he cares about inflation? Colin Allred and Ted Cruz trying to burn down the other's bipartisan pitch. Congressman Allred and Kamala Harris are both running on the same radical agenda. He's been one of the most divisive senators in the entire country. For months, both candidates have been selling their appeal to the other side. Both Senator Cruz Cruz and Congressman Allred need to paint each other as outside the mainstream. Ryan, you have seen that throughout this campaign, both guys have tried to portray themselves as bipartisan problem solvers. But the most divisive issues took precedence. The Transgender Bill of Rights explicitly, and he co-sponsored it, mandated that boys compete against girls sports. What he wants you thinking about is kids in bathrooms so you're not thinking about women in hospitals because it's indefensible. Both hoping Texans connect with their Texan biographies, recognizing the historic stakes of this election. We want to go a little deeper into the debate and the race for Senate. Joining us now for Insight is John Moritz, the chief politics reporter for the Austin American Statesman, and James Henson, executive director of the Texas Politics Project at UT Austin. Welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. Glad to be. Uh, John, I want to start with you. This was a big chance for both candidates to make their impressions on undecided voters, both of them. Do you think that there was um, a, any standout moments where they were able uh, to speak to maybe voters that wouldn't normally vote for them? I, I think for Allred, the challenge was to become known to, to those who haven't been paying attention or just now tuning in. I think his biggest moment was when he basically said, I was ready to do battle with the insurrectionists and uh, uh, Senator Cruz was hiding in a closet. I think if people were just kind of looking at, um, is this guy up to the task? Is, does, he, does he have the... Um, uh, the wherewithal to be a, a fighter for Texas. I think that was probably his best chance to do that. Uh, I don't want to step on James's message about the undecided uh, <laughs> votes and, and where they might be because he's he's more knowledgeable and has, has fresher information. But that, that was my takeaway. <laughs> well, sure. Let, let's go to Jim. Your your new poll um, always asks what issues are most important for voters, right. and they consistently tell us that that is the economy. Um, for Republicans, especially, it's immigration and border security. The debate, though, focused on, on some of the most divisive niche issues that maybe don't rank as high, like abortion, like transgender rights. Where, where do those uh, issues rank in, in terms of how voters tell us they are important? Well, abortion is in the top three or so for Democrats. Um, you know, because you know, Democrats this cycle look like we've seen them look in the past. There's no one issue that dominates what 
Democrats are interested in. But abortion is in the top three, and so I wasn't surprised um, to see Colin Allred want to talk about that, nor was I surprised to see Ted Cruz not want to talk about that. Um, because where abortion policy is in the state right now um, has kind of gotten ahead of where Republican public opinion is. And I think that's why I think you almost saw, I, I thought, a little bit of sigh of somewhere between relief and enthusiasm when the first question in the debate was about abortion. Right. Uh, your poll gives Cruz a seven point lead. Th that's a little bit more favorable than we've seen. Uh, kind of the average is like three to five points for yeah. Cruz. Um, but I'm wondering, how does that uh, rank with how, say, Beto O'Rourke was polling at this point in the race in 2018? Do we have any insight? There? Yeah, you know, it's pretty close, actually. I think O'Rourke might have been a point or two better overall. I think the most interesting thing in that poll was in that comparison. Uh, and you're talking about undecided voters right. and where the campaigns are targeting, is that O'Rourke in, O'Rourke in 18, Allred in 24 in October, they look very similar among independents, mm. right? People with loose party attachments, only eight or 9% of the electorate probably, right. true independents, but remarkably close, you know? And so I think if you're calling Allred, you feel like that's a pretty good sign with a few weeks to go. Both campaigns are trying to flex their crossover appeal, right? You have, you have Ted Cruz um, uh, touting Democratic endorsements and, and vice versa with Allred. You did some reporting about uh, how each campaign is trying to do that. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on why um, crossing over to the other party may help these campaigns? Well, well, crossover is nothing new in Texas. It goes back to the 1950s, and mostly because there's always been a dominant party, and, and so not everybody in that dominant party is going to be on board, and sometimes not everybody in the minority party is going to be on board. But, but what, the, um, what, what the key here is, is uh, for Allred, it shows or it, it reinforces his message that he is the most bipartisan member of the Texas delegation. And, and for Cruz, it sort of softens the notion that he is this a hard right partisan, no compromise, take no prisoners. If he can get a Kim Og, even though she was voted out of her own party uh, in, in the primary, if he can get some of these uh, sheriffs and elected officials in South Texas, many of whom are Hispanic, to basically become uh, his voice, uh, vouch for him, that does take some of the, um, mm -hmm. the rough edge off of Ted Cruz's reputation for the last 12 years or more. Right, and same with Allred. I mean, he's, he's touting the Liz Cheney endorsement, who also was voted out of the uh, it, Republican it, it, Party. And, and that's the other thing, is a lot of these uh, crossover uh, political figures have nothing to lose. They, yeah. They've been basically exiled from their, from their own island and are swimming around looking for a new one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to get in trouble. Uh, John, Jim, uh, I feel honored just to be at this table with you two. Some expert insight. Thank you very much for joining us. Works both ways. <laughs> Great to be here. A bombshell order from a Texas federal court could bring a sudden end to a 13-year legal battle over how the state cares for children in its foster care system. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued a striking order in the long-standing fight over foster care in Texas. It removes the federal judge who has overseen the case for more than a decade. Investigator Avery Travis has been following this case for years. Avery, thank you for being here. Take us through the impacts of this huge decision. Well, Judge Janice Jack has overseen this case since it was filed, and that was in 2011. She's known for demanding change from the state agencies who are tasked with caring for kids who are in the system. Uh, we've talked before on this show about contentious hearings between the judge uh, and the attorneys representing the state. Several times she's held the state in contempt of court for failing to meet make the changes that she's required and meet her court-ordered reforms. She very recently, earlier this year, wanted the state uh, to pay a $100,000 fine every day for failing mm. to meet two of those orders in specific. That order of hers asking them to pay is really the focus of this update that we're now getting. The, now, the state appealed Jack's decision. Not only did a panel of judges from the appeals course remove her from the case and reassign the case, they also removed that last order of hers, reversing those daily fines. Now, in their order, the panel of judges says that 
Judge Jack has a pattern of disrespect when dealing with the state and its attorneys, calling into question at least the appearance of fairness in the case. A lot of complicated legal drama there, but with very human impact. Mm. Uh, how are the people involved reacting to this? As I mentioned there, the, the state and really the state agencies who are at the heart of this, that's the Department of Family and Protective Services, the child welfare arm of the, of the state, um, but also the Health and Human Services uh, Department. They uh, basically say that they are thankful that the appeals court recognized the reforms and the significant efforts that they've made to meet the judge's orders. And they also noted, uh, you know, the money that has been spent by the state, millions, to make these changes. On the flip side, though, the plaintiff's attorneys, who represents thousands of children in this case, uh, called this, and I want to quote him directly, a sad day for Texas children. Mm. He really praised the efforts of Judge Jack over the years fighting for these kids. He said, quote, she deserves a medal for all that she has done. And wow. he says there they're going to continue fighting this decision to reassign the case. Where does it go from here? I mean, what are the next steps? It's an important question. So really, this decision came from a panel of three judges of the Court of Appeals. And so that plaintiff's attorney we mentioned, Paul Yetter, he says they're going to appeal this and they really want a hearing in front of the full Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. They do have a deadline that's coming up in just about a week to file that appeal. And they tell us that they are planning to do so. Wow. Uh, Avery Travis, that is not an easy story, um, but it's so important. Thank you so much for your years of following this. And thank you uh, for joining us on this week's episode of State of Texas. I'm Ryan Chandler. We'll be back next week to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.